Thank you, Madam Speaker. And along with other members on behalf of the ACT Greens, I would like to give my sincere and heartfelt thanks to all the emergency responders that have worked so hard to keep our city safe over this difficult summer. It has also been an incredible coordinated effort of our entire public service. And I would like to acknowledge the role that everyone has played from the Education and Community Services Directorate's proactive coordination of evacuation and respite centres to the long hours media advisors and communications officials have put in to ensure a consistent stream of quality advice and information to our community, to our parks and conservation rangers and ACT police. Everyone has contributed and should be proud of their efforts. A standout, of course, is our incredible emergency services personnel. They have the thanks and admiration of all of us, and their level of dedication and sacrifice has been incredible. The Commissioner, Georgina Whelan, deserves special thanks and credit. As the head of the ESA, she has been so hardworking, calm and communicative. It has been great leadership, and I know the Canberra community have been highly appreciative. We need to thank all of the people who have gone beyond their usual roles to assist during these difficult times. People from other agencies like the Australian Defence Force who have given up their family time to assist. People who have travelled from overseas to offer assistance. Usually you hear of people making sacrifices to help their fellow countrymen. Here we have people helping their fellow humans regardless of borders. It is just people helping people with a true global spirit. It is, of course, not just being the officials and volunteers, but regular members of the community have banded together to help. They've given donations, provided shelter, or even just lent care and support to people in need of it, and to the fellow community members in a difficult time. We've seen tremendous efforts from our non-government organisations, those such as Red Cross and WISE, or perhaps some of the higher profile ones in their different roles, but there are many others who are more localised or who've played their very specialist roles and contributed to both the immediate response needs and will continue to contribute to the longer term efforts. And I think of those individuals that we've heard the media stories of who've just decided something needed to be done and created a Facebook group and put together friends and supporters from the community to get in and give a hand. While the events have been a tragedy for Australia, they have also shown communities at their best, their most generous, courageous and caring. A broad range of senior ACT government officials have worked very hard over the summer, many interrupting their break. In particular, I note the role of the Chief Minister and Minister Gentleman, who it seems have virtually lived at the ESA headquarters over this period and have shown great dedication to the Canberra community. I also want to solemnly acknowledge that the events of this summer have taken people's lives both the lives of everyday people whose homes were struck by fires, as well as volunteers and officials who lost their lives fighting the fires. This is a terrible tragedy, and we offer our condolences and sympathies to all the families and friends of the people we lost. There have also been widespread, has also been widespread destruction of property and of our precious environment, and this simply amplifies the scale of the tragedy. For the ACT, while the fires within the Territory it's themselves were relatively recent, the impacts of this horrific summer of tragedy and loss had been felt for months in the way of smoke haze, dust storms and regional fires, fires right up through New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria, South Australia and Western Australia. It felt, it's felt at times like no part of the country has been untouched. In this area, I'd like to, in the context of things like smoke haze, I'd particularly like to acknowledge the hard work of the Chief Health Officer and her team, who have sought to provide the best possible advice to an anxious community in what has been described as an unprecedented poor and, in fact, potentially hazardous period of air quality, with Canberra at times officially having the worst air quality in the world. It is hard to draw an evidence-based response to a unique and novel issue, and I thank those who've worked so hard to provide advice to our community who were so uncertain about what this meant for us, something we've never really experienced before. Across the nation, we have seen communities rightly praise the work of the predominantly volunteer fire services. I've been personally struck by the artistic expressions of this appreciation, from street art to media cartoons showing a weary firefighter being saluted by Batman and other comic book superheroes. I genuinely do not feel that like this is hyperbole to say that they have earned such praise. 
with feats of bravery and self-sacrifice that unfortunately I believe we will see more of in the future. As the Chief Minister has rightly acknowledged, however, this is not the end of the bushfire and storm season. The recent rain, welcome as it is, is creating its own issues, just as the recent hailstorm did. And we cannot, cannot ignore the fact that there may yet still be further fires or freak storm activity. But we are starting to, as a country and as a territory, collectively breathe a little easier and consider what possible lessons can be learned from this terrible summer. We are all aware of the national conversations regarding commissions of inquiries and the need to more closely examine the specific needs of small localities. We believe we need federal leadership and local solutions. It will be a partnership going forward and these conversations will be very important to think through carefully on an evidence basis. We must also continue to work across borders and governments in the appraisal of the incredible ecological damage that has hit our national parks and reserves. The destruction of native habitat and alpine bushland in adjoining Kosciuszko National Park, of the woodlands and grasslands of the Monero, and the significant loss of our coastal forests and scrub, and of course, the impact on our own Namaji National Park and related areas. These will all have implications for our flora and fauna that are not yet fully understood. I was encouraged to see the Minister for the Environment's recent reporting of the Defence Force's collaboration with ACT Parks and Conservation regarding the corroboree frog, and trust that over the coming months all levels of government will continue to work together on similar <coughs> programs, and also to consult and work with our traditional custodians as we take the lessons of Indigenous land management, both in recovery, but also in thinking ahead to further hazard reduction uh, for the future. Our community has been significantly impacted in multiple ways throughout this crisis. One unexpected but serious impact has been the smoke pool that has frequently settled on our city. As we started to experience poor air quality and high levels of smoke in early December, Canberrans were forced to start making changes to their daily lives they had not previously had to contemplate. As, our, as outdoor activities were curtailed, even our homes, office buildings, shopping centres and movie theatres were impacted due to the severity of smoke and compromise in air quality. This was extremely disruptive to people's lives. There are many issues that stem from this and I will talk more about them in my motion on Thursday. For now, I want to acknowledge that the events of the summer have had impact on people's mental health and wellbeing, with many feeling frustrated, upset and disheartened. These feelings were only heightened as the Christmas and New Year's period rolled in and the bushfires increased dramatically in neighbouring parts of New South Wales and around the country. It was an eerie and difficult time seeing up, seeking updates via television, radio and the various apps that we all now have on our phones. Many of us acknowledge, understand and feel strongly that climate change has contributed to the early fire seasons, length and severity of the fires and this growing concern about the changes in our environment due to climate change manifests into, into a sense of climate change anxiety and grief, and for some people does take a toll on their mental health. I think it would be accurate to say that across the nation there has been a shared sadness over this period. We tragically saw the loss of wildlife, ecosystems, homes and human life and what can only be described as a large-scale catastrophe. As we look for hope and positives in all of this, one can only be inspired by the resilience and determination demonstrated by so much of our community through these difficult times. We have come together through our shared grief, we have supported one another, and these are the times where having a strong community and looking out for one another is so incredibly powerful and important. As the Minister for both Mental Health and Climate Change, the confluence of these two issues and the inevitable impact it has on people's lives underlines the need to equip our community to manage how they experience the devastating impacts of these sort of circumstances. The response in the ACT with input from ACT Health, Canberra Health Services and the Office for Mental Health and Wellbeing has been a good example of where to start. I know that through the ACT's evacuation and respite centres, particularly over the New Year's period, attendees wanted to talk to the mental health support staff about their mental health and seek advice on what they, are, they were feeling and how to approach or respond to those feelings. In today's discussion, perhaps I can simply paraphrase the advice of the Chief Psychiatrist, 
Denise Reardon, who highlighted the importance of being kind to ourselves and one another and taking the time to process the experience and what we are feeling. When we talk about the fires and smoke that have affected us so badly, it is also important that we are upfront about the causes of the tragedy. This is the only way we can ensure we improve our response at a government level and take actions that protect us in the future. We can't make sound decisions if we shy away from the reality. Despite the issue, of this, sorry, despite the efforts of some commentators and others to obfuscate on this issue, there is no doubt that climate change is a significant contributing factor to the terrible summer we've experienced. These aren't debatable facts. The science is clear. We simply have to listen to the experts on this matter, the climate scientists, the firefighters, and the bushfire experts. We need to listen to people like the group of 24 fire and emergency chiefs and ex-chiefs who've been calling for greater climate action uh, and who've been trying to desperately make this point in all sorts of forums. These are people with decades of leadership experience in fire and emergency management, the type of people we've been thanking in our speeches today. And they say, and I quote, climate change has supercharged the bushfire problem. Just a one degree Celsius temperature rise has meant the extremes are far more extreme and it is placing lives at risk, including firefighters. They also emphasise the importance of talking about the cause of the, of the future. They say, and I quote, the Grenfell fire in London, people talked about the cause from day one. Train crashes they talk from day one. And it is okay to say it is an arsonist's fault or pretend that the Greenies are stopping hazard reduction burning, which is simply not true. But you are not allowed to talk about climate change. Well, we are because we know what is happening. We can also listen to the climate scientists like Dr. Tom Beer, who wrote that the world's, he wrote the world's first bushfire and climate change paper and worked at the CSIRO for 30 years. And Professor David Bowman, a professor of pyrogeography and fire science, and Professor Will Steffen, emeritus, emeritus professor at the ANU and a former member of our own Climate Change Council. They made a statement together saying that climate scientists have been warning Australian governments about the escalating threat of catastrophic bushfire conditions because of climate change for 30 years. They said that, and I quote, climate change is fueling the national bushfire catastrophe and it will get worse without radical action. The fact is that climate change is leading to hotter temperatures, a drier environment, more frequent, longer and more intense heat waves, shifting rain patterns and more severe bushfire conditions. The ACT is simply getting hotter and drier. 2019 was the hottest year on record with an annual temperature 1.52 degrees Celsius above the long-term average and nine of the 10 hottest years have been recorded since 2005. 2019 also had the lowest rainfall records, rainfall since records began. And this is the first time this has occurred in the same year as the high temperature record. These discussions will continue, but in response to the Chief Minister's motion, I firstly thank you for bringing it forward and providing this assembly with the opportunity to reflect on what has been an extremely difficult time. In conclusion, I simply want to again emphasise the heartfelt thanks and admiration we have for all the people who've worked so hard and sacrificed so much to keep our community safe, to help those who have found themselves deeply impact impacted by these and to begin the rebuilding process. It really shows humanity at its best. And I hope that we can reflect on these moments, draw on the strengths that we've seen and go forward together to tackle the challenges that we face in the future. The question is that the motion is agreed to.